Hey guys, it's Joel and welcome back to the channel. And today I've got my hands on this gorgeous 2002 996 Porsche 911 Carrera 4S. And I'm going to give you my brutally honest opinion on it. Now the 996 generation of 911 was a controversial one, mainly because of its styling. And the thing that got people the most was the fried egg as they were deemed headlights. It was this weird shape, which is only on this generation of 911, which they did away with in the next generation in the 997. These ones are not quite as bad as the ones that everyone moans about, which are the earlier cars, which have this part down here in orange. And it does look like a fried egg. And I have said previously, actually in my 997 Carrera 4S review a few weeks back, that I never really minded this styling of lights. In fact, I quite like it. And I have to say that the car we have in question today is gorgeous. I think the 996 divides opinions, but certainly of the 996, I think these wide body 4Ss are the best looking. Just the big gopping mouth at the front and those wide arches at the rear give it a certain level of road presence that other models perhaps don't have. But the 996, as many of you will know, came around in around 1997, 1998, and went all the way to 2005 when the 997 was introduced. And there were many, many variants of this car, different engine displacements as well. But today's car in question is a Carrera 4S, so it is slightly updated in the looks department, but it also has the 3.6 litre flat six engine in the back, capable of making around 315 horsepower and about 275 pounds feet of torque. But the important bit with that is that it develops that 315 horsepower at 6,800 RPM. The red line in this is around 7,300. So it really is all at the top end to get to that power. Out of the box, these aren't particularly fast, actually by modern day standards at least. 0-62 is around five seconds with this, which is a six speed manual. And the top speed just a shade under 175 miles per hour, but probably quick enough for the road. And we'll find that out a little bit later on. It's still not a particularly large car. It comes in at under four and a half meters long, about 1.85, 1.85 meters wide and weighing around 1550 kilograms in this manual format. It's also not a very tall thing. It's only 1.3 meters high. And so even me at very, very average height uh, is towering over it. And all in all, that just makes it along with the fantastic proportions of the thing. I said this about the 997 as well. I would say a very pretty car. And I know many of you might think that's a bit controversial because the 996 is one of the most, well, probably the most hated 911 generation. But I think these are coming into their own now. I, I would like to put my hands up and say I've always liked the 996 and that is true. But I do think people are starting to appreciate these more. And Actually, when you go onto the classifieds and look at what these cost and how much you could obtain one for, they are starting to look like pretty, pretty good value indeed. Whilst we're stood at the back, I should just mention there's a few modifications with this car, a uh, few of which are on the inside, but the main one on the outside is just the sound. So the exhausts are non-standard, or at least the back boxes have been changed uh, for slightly less restricted models, which just give a little bit more noise. But I've already found out it's pretty well judged and certainly not overbearing, very much in line with how a 911 should be. So let's jump inside the 996 quickly then. Firstly, to escape the atrocious weather that we're having here in mid-July, but also because there's quite a lot of things to discuss. So immediately when you jump inside, you're quite aware of how small the car is. It does feel relatively tight in here. Dare I say a little bit tighter than in 997, for example. You've got a relatively small and sharply angled windscreen with a view out over those fantastic wheel arches. And when you glance below, you're greeted by the iconic five Porsche dials. We have our battery voltage, our speedo with the digital speedo below, rev counter displaying that glorious 7,300 RPM red line. And then on the gauge to the right of that, we have our water temperature, our fuel gauge, and then an oil pressure gauge too. Again, as I said with 997, all the information that you need is right in front of you. You do not have to take your eyes off where you're going or off these dials. Everything you're gonna need is there. And we can conveniently see here the mileage of this car, which is just 56,000 miles. This is a particularly lovely example that has been looked after, cherished, and it's been owned by Peter, the owner of this, for just over a year now. And he's 
absolutely loving it. Speaking of Peter, the owner of this car as well, he's been an absolute legend and provided me with this certificate of authenticity from Porsche uh, in which it specifies all the exact options that this car has. Uh, it's becoming a theme now with the reviews that I do. I think ever since I did that Jag XKR where the owner provided me with a document of special information about that car, I'm now getting information from owners, which is tremendously helpful. But I can tell you then that this particular car, on oh, the date of registration, was the 4th of October 2002. How interesting. And it's a seal grey metallic. That gorgeous deep grey that you see on the exterior of this is seal grey metallic. It's a really complex and deep grey. It really looks fantastic, even on a dull day like today. So these are all things that didn't come standard with your 996 Carrera 4S. The self-dimming inner and outer rear view mirrors with rain sensors. Leather sport seats, so these were optional seats. The aluminium gear shifter and handbrake lever. Heated seats, of course, they're still an option in Porsches today. Rear wiper, so you didn't have to have that. And there's a few others on there which we could go on for hours about. But all things that you might find a standard in ordinary cars, but not in a Porsche. Now, things that have been changed in this Porsche since the factory are the wheel has been clad in Alcantara, which I'm a big, big fan of. It just makes you feel so much more involved with the car, any car that you're driving, that is. I love an Alcantara steering wheel, so that's been done bit in line with what the 996 GT3 had. And also for that, it's had the 996 GT3 shifter put in, which just makes the throws a little bit shorter and I'd say a bit more precise than the standard shifter. It was the same in my 986 Boxster and other 996s that I've driven. It's just a little bit wallowy and slightly too long in terms of the throw. So this does improve it, but we'll get into that a little bit once we drive the car. And this has had the PCCM Plus or the Apple CarPlay system from Porsche installed. So Porsche are quite amazing and they really do offer a lot of support for their classic cars. This would be classed as one of those. And for pretty much every single model of Porsche going back to at least this era, you can get an Apple CarPlay system. So you can buy it from Porsche so it's compatible, then you have to get it fitted. They are quite expensive. I believe this one's around 1500 quid and then probably about 500 pounds for fitting on top of that. So a couple of grand all in. My KN has got an Apple CarPlay system, it's not the Porsche one, and just using this on the way here, I would personally say if you're planning on driving these fairly regularly, it's a no-brainer. It's a really, really worthwhile money to spend, a really, really worthwhile upgrade to do. It integrates seamlessly into the car, it doesn't look non-standard at all, and it works tremendously well. It's very responsive and looks in line with the latest models. The seats are quite narrow, but they're very comfortable for someone like me. There's not too much adjustability. In fact, I'm not sure you can do anything to change the bolsters or lumbar. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I certainly can't see or feel any controls for that. We've just got backwards and forwards recline, a manual forwards and backwards seat adjuster there, and then we can go up and down, but that is actually it. So if you have a larger build, you might struggle to get comfortable in this. There's a handy storage bin beside me here, underneath the armrest. There's one in the middle. There's somewhere for your smalls, your coins or your keys here. And then there's a tray, which is normally conveniently phone sized. However, with this Apple CarPlay, there's a little box there for connecting your phone that's been installed. So you can't quite get your phone in that, but ordinarily it's really good. There's the very nicely designed cup holders hidden away in here and the generous glove box down here. That's more or less it in terms of storage, obviously not mentioning the rear seats. This is a 911, of course, so there are two seats in the back, which are not really suitable for grown adults, but they're certainly suitable for stuff and actually children in this owner's case. There is a child seat in the back, which is fantastic to see. I mean, what a car to be driven around in as a child. Obviously, over on the passenger side, there is also another storage compartment under the armrest, and there's a little indent here where on this side, I have the controls for my boot and engine cover. We've got manual controls for our lights over on the right-hand side here. A pretty generous pedal box, nothing too close together, apart from the brake and throttle, which just only makes it easy to heel and tow this thing. We've then got a control here, which we can go through the kind of limited trip menu on. We can see our MPG, our range, things like that, all the basics and indicator stalk. But I will say all of these stalks just feel so lovely to use. It's just, you know, they don't make things like this anymore. It's even in the 997, they're not as dainty and delicate as these. They're just very satisfying indeed. We'll go through the Porsche system in a minute. This car, we've got a nice headliner and also a sunroof, which is cool. 
air conditioning below, heated seats as we found out that this car has electric window switches. Here we have the knob which tells us how sensitive we want our automatic wipers to be. So you just flick the wiper switch onto the first notch and then adjust this accordingly to be as sensitive as you like. I quite like that actually. Um, we can turn off our traction control. We can also activate our rear wiper by pressing that button. We have a cigarette lighter port here button for locking and unlocking the car and a button to activate the rear heated screen. That is it. So let's just have a quick look at this Porsche Apple CarPlay system to see what you're getting for your £2,000. And then I think we'll go for a drive. So as I mentioned, it's all sort of OEM plus. So even when you turn the car on, you get the Porsche logo coming up. It's even all in the Porsche font as well. And then this initial screen looks exactly like say 991. So we can connect a phone via USB like so. And then very quickly, will have access to Apple CarPlay, which is just fantastic. I always think it's so novel in an older car like this. It works just like a newer thing. In fact, it's probably just as responsive, if not more. You've got your Spotify, Google Maps, and everything that you would normally have on Apple CarPlay. And then if we go back to the home page, there is of course an integrated map that comes with this system, which you probably wouldn't use if you're using Apple CarPlay. You can adjust things like the date and time on the system and obviously sound controls, things like that, whether you want more bass, etc. etc. In terms of the car itself, well, with 996 as standard, there weren't really any, well, there wasn't any configuration you could particularly do in the system. We just have a button for traction control and that's more or less it. So there's nothing we can particularly configure with the car. But I would say this is definitely, definitely worth upgrading to, especially if your 996 doesn't have the original system, because you at least got some functionality with that. But this, I mean, just ultimately, it allows you to seamlessly plug in your phone and use Apple CarPlay. It makes it a much more usable car, and you can just listen to your podcast, listen to your Spotify, put your sat-nav on as you would in something much newer, which I just think makes these cars so much more attractive. And it's only going to lengthen their lives, really, because it's just going to extend that amount of time that people want to live with these things and keep them going. So I'm all for it. And this is, yeah, a really, really, I have to say, lovely system. And if my KN didn't have the aftermarket one, I would genuinely probably pay a couple of grand to have this put in, seriously. So that's enough of that. Why don't we switch this car on now go for a drive and see what the 996 C4S is all about. So here we are then in the 996 C4S and boy, does it always feel good to be driving a Porsche? I've always said that these things get underneath your skin and it is just absolutely true. The more time I spend around these 911s, the more I feel myself gravitating towards the classifieds looking at them. They do just have a way of making you feel special from the driving position to the big white dials in front of you. Even when you fill it up at the petrol station, you stand at the front of the car and your view to the right is of the gorgeous front end and your view to the left in terms of this C4S is of that gorgeous rear arch. And then there's the engine. It's such an addictive soundtrack with any flat six Porsche. It just develops a buzz and a fizz as you push up through the RPMs and you're forever chasing it when you're driving a 911. I think one of the first things you'll notice jumping inside a 996 and driving it down the road are the noise levels. It is quite a noisy cabin. We've got pretty large rear tires. I believe they're 295 section, so that won't help. But obviously the sound insulation and all that sort of stuff isn't quite as advanced as the more modern 911s. In fact, the 997 Cabriolet that I most recently drove in terms of 911 was noticeably quieter than this and I said that that was quite a noisy cabin so that's the first thing that struck me with this although I suppose the trade-off is that even with the windows up <laughs> yeah we can hear more of that gorgeous 3.6 litre flat six in the back of the car
and it does sound almighty with the subtle exhaust modifications that Peter, the owner of this car, has done. But if I am to compare this to the 997, which is the most recent 911 I drove last week, this car feels a little bit more settled on the road. That felt slightly fidgety and quite firm. This has a softer ride, and don't get me wrong, it's not soft by any stretch of the imagination. You feel everything going on underneath you, but it just feels a little bit more steadied and planted across the road. To be fair, that 997 was a Cabriolet, so there's gonna be some differences there between that and this being a coupe. But just on initial observations, this does feel a little bit more happy just driving along these slightly imperfect roads. I mean, what roads aren't imperfect in this country anymore? But despite the road noise, when you're cruising along in sixth gear, it's pretty civilized. The engine itself is relatively quiet under around 3000 RPM, 60 miles per hour now, we're at just over 2000 RPM and we're actually returning around 30 miles per gallon, which is quite impressive for something that's capable of 170-ish miles an hour and a five-ish second nought to 60 time. And for something that looks quite as exquisite as this. Now, unfortunately, I've just had a battery slash generator warning come up and the voltage on the car is now below 12. So, I'm gonna take it a little bit easy for the remainder of this review and hopefully about 30 minutes from the owner's house I can get this back that's a little bit of a weird one generally speaking these 911s are quite easy ish or fairly painless things to work on from knowing the guys at ePorsche quite well obviously there's issues with IMS and so it's good to get these cars scoped before you go ahead and buy one. That warning light has just gone off. So um, yeah, fingers crossed everything is okay. I'll keep my eyes on it. But all in all, from my Porsche ownership experiences, I've never ever had any sort of anxiety about things going wrong. They have all been extremely reliable, for me at least. So we can talk about the handling. It's, as you expect, very communicative, very Porsche-like. It's always the same with any model that I've driven. Even my KN has pretty communicative steering given the sheer size of it. This 996, I would say, is slightly less responsive than certainly the 997. There's a bit more input required to turn at the same angle as that car. It's not quite as direct, but still very good in feel. And speaking of feel, this gear shifter makes a big difference actually. It feels lovely and it's great to go through the gears and it encourages you to do so. And as I mentioned earlier, the pedal box is designed in such a way that heel and toe or just downshift rev matching is second nature. I mean, I'm not a particularly good driver and I find that extremely easy to do in this car and it's not always easy to do that. But now that I've been driving this a little bit longer, I'm really starting to gel with it. And actually the fact that it's quite a noisy cabin, the fact that the steering isn't ever so direct and too darty means that I'm actually having a really good time just cruising along. And, and sometimes I have this thing with cars like this, and I tend to talk about it in these reviews quite frequently, where I'm just feeling like kind of guilty for not using all the power. But this 911, it, it feels fun and exciting even just cruising along behind this van at 50 miles an hour because you've got that constant communication going on between you and the pedals and the wheels and it just feels quite raw and i said this in my 997 review that that's just ever so slightly more refined than the 996 but what this offers you is a slightly more stripped back and slightly more honest driving experience. There's just an extra layer of technology less in this thing and you do really just feel at one with the car. So whether you are getting on it or just driving along to work, this is a tremendously enjoyable thing to pilot along the road. But then when you do feel like going up through the revs, you are rewarded in such a great way. It's actually faster than you would expect it to be. Given it's only 315 horsepower, it, it does feel quicker than that. 
So when I put my foot down, I don't really feel myself wanting for more. In fact, I quite enjoy just using like a quarter throttle and slowly enjoying that rev range. It's a really simple car, this, and it's so, so easy to get into it and to drive it not just fast, but well. other types of cars that you can obtain within this sort of price range, circa 20, maybe 25,000 pounds. Well, truth be told, there's a lot of options if you're looking for something performance related. You can have anything from a Maserati Gran Turismo to a Jaguar XKR, or even if you want to something slightly more on the luxurious side, a Bentley Continental GT. But then there's other things like BMW M3s, the E92 generation, if you want something that's got rear seats like a 911. But I have to say, in and amongst all of those groups of cars and fabulous cars that I've just mentioned, this one really stands out to me. And the reason for that is, well, partly because it's a 911. That carries such weight. I think most children or most petrol heads one day want to own a Porsche 911. And then there's the way it drives. It has a unique characteristic with the engine being at the back. The front end goes light when you start to push on. And that's another addictive sensation that you crave in this car. And one that's hard to find in something else. Then there's the way it looks too. I think, especially with these wide body cars like the Carrera 4S, it's just so impeccably proportioned and there's really not a bad angle that you can view this car from, in my opinion. And then I can go on to talk about the character of this car, of which there is so much. You don't get that same level of emotion from the Jaguar 5 litre engine. Okay, the BMW 4 litre V8 that you'll find in the E92, is pretty up there actually but there's just something so special about the raspiness and the linear delivery of these flat six porsche motors that again is hard to find elsewhere and some of those other cars like that jaguar x car is probably just too fast for you to enjoy all of that power on the road and then the e92 m3 is a bit spiky it's a bit more demanding to drive that thing fast and not end up in a hedge. This thing is truly intuitive and very, very rewarding to drive fast. As you can see, I am a big fan. I wouldn't necessarily want to do miles and miles in this thing. The seats aren't adjustable enough for me. Even I'm getting slightly squeaky in here. It is quite noisy as well. I'd like to have one that had cruise control. The Apple CarPlay does a lot to help the whole comfort and usability of this thing but it's not quite refined enough like an M3 or a Jag to potentially take on mega, mega journeys. Of course you could do it, but there's better options out there, even a Maserati Gran Turismo for that sort of task. But as an all-rounder, there's not much that comes close to a 996, 911, especially even the non 4S variants, a Carrera 2 or Carrera 4, both of which I've reviewed before, can be had in nice condition for about 15 grand. And it's just a, well, wonderful place to put your money if it's burning a hole in your pocket. Because the values of these things certainly aren't gonna go down much more, if at all. So I'm going to cut this review ever so slightly short as I want to focus on getting this car safely back to its owner. I've got that battery warning light coming off and on sporadically. So I just want to get it back to uh, the good owner, that is Peter. I want to thank him for letting me take the car out today and I want to thank you for watching this video. And as always, I'd like to invite your comments below. What do you think about the 996? Would you have a Jag XK over one? Maybe a Maserati Gran Turismo? Or even a BMW M3 like I've been talking about? I want to hear from you, so do comment below and also feel free to send me an email if you've got a car like this that you'd like to see me review on the channel. Thank you all ever so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one very, very soon.
Hell. This f This f weather man. Peter, if you're watching, I'm really sorry. I'm trying my best to keep the mud out. Ah. Oh.